Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Purple Pill Philosophy is interviewing Mark David Hall. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. How about you guys? Could be better. Good, good. good. Uh, yep, and this is um, Mr. Brass, and this is also my friend Robert Freed. Say hi to everyone, Robert Freed. Hello, everyone. I'm kind of back from a bit of a hiatus, so... <laughs> Yeah. So, how's everything been going with the quarantine with you guys? You guys doing all well? I got my um, HECU equipment ready. <laughs> HECU is the um, Hazardous Environment um, co Combat Unit from Half-Life. <laughs> yeah. So, you've been doing well, um, Dr. Hall? Yeah, we're moving all our classes online, which is kind of a pain, but, you know, it's good to be safe. And otherwise, yeah. daughter's doing school online, and we're just hunkering down at home, so that's all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Codes? Who's Codes? Carlos. Who's Carlos? Whatever you are. I go by many names. Yeah. Nobody knows my real right. name. It's like the Matrix. <laughs> but, all right. So we wanted to get... It's an honor to have you on here. I remember I first figured, um, learned about you when I was looking up a, um, a video on the Constitution, and I happened to run across some articles that you wrote. Uh, I managed to go through your book recently, and we and my friends here, they've been wanting to talk to you as well for a while, more so for your debate that you've had with Andrew Seidel. Of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Yeah. So, um, you want to tell the audience about you if they don't know? Sure. So, I'm a professor of politics at George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon. And I've done a lot of work on religion and politics in America, especially religious liberty, church-state relations. So, I've written or edited a dozen academic books, but Did America Have a Christian Founding is my first book aimed at a popular audience, uh, the general reading public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could tell that. It, it's not that, I believe it's only like 170 pages. That's right, 50,000 words, and they were religious about that. They said I could not go over at all. Yeah, I think I came in at like 56,000, and they made me cut it down, and it's probably about 52,000. But yeah, it was absolutely um, a strict limit on how many words it could be. Uh, so I imagine there was a lot of, con like, are you the type of person that goes over or like in your writings or do you go under? Oh, absolutely over every time. And so, yeah, it's a real matter of discipline and then having to cut after that. Yeah, because I know some people that they're, they go more under and so they tend up having to pad things out to get it to the extra limit. So you seem to have the reverse. That's right. I see that all the time in my students. <laughs> you assign a 10-page paper, and it comes in at 8, and so they have to do all this padding. It's really annoying. You ever thought about doing it in volumes? I'm sorry, thought about what? Doing it in volumes. Yeah, so there's already a planned sequel, and I'm working on that. I'm about three-quarters of the way done. And so that was part. There were a few issues I wanted to address in the first book. And I convinced my editor to let me push them off to the sequel. So, yeah, hopefully what I did in the first book, I did each chapter well, and then I can return and address some unaddressed issues in the um, next volume. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I believe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you say you're, you fall more under the accommodationist or originalist position yourself? Yeah, so I... Um, yeah, I would say with respect to constitutional interpretation, I'm an originalist, which of course means that the Constitution, or really any law, but let's just focus on the Constitution, should be interpreted first in light of the text. But if the text is unclear, we, could go, we should go to the original understanding, what America's founders and ratifiers understood it to mean. And if we don't like where that leaves us, there are still avenues for change. Um, we can amend the Constitution or we can pass laws to change things. Um, but yeah, with respect to interpreting the Constitution, I'm very much an ori originalist. How would you distinguish this from, let's say, a separationist or accounts? 
for you know for the audience that may not know the difference in these terms. Yeah, sure. Well, originalism could apply to everything, not just the First Amendment. With respect to the First Amendment, and specifically with respect to the Establishment Clause, I argue that the Establishment Clause pretty much means what it says, that we aren't going to have a national church, that the United States of America cannot create a um, one official church, and now by extension, the states can't create churches either. So Oregon, Alabama, Virginia can't have state churches either. Other than that, there's a lot of leeway for ways in which government can or other religious organizations or promote religion. So things like presidents issuing um, presidential uh, calls for prayer and fasting or Thanksgiving Day proclamations, perfectly constitutional. Um, us government partnering with Catholic charities to help poor people, perfectly constitutional. Yeah. Oh, Oh, putting a, a, a star of David in its memorial. Again, perfectly constitutional. So that's more or less the accommodationist perspective, which I think is demanded by an originalist approach to the Constitution. Um, the separationists, on the other hand, want to pretend that there's a wall of separation between church and state, which prohibits, say, a, um, uh, a president from issuing a call for prayer that would prohibit the use of the Star of David in a state Holocaust memorial and so forth. So kind of what they're more for is um, like what the fringe established during the 1905 law on separation of church and state. Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. So, um, you know, the French revolution was very much a revolution against the Catholic church and they wanted the to create like, what's that? The Christianization campaign. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. I remember, like, from what I can, what I read of separationist, a lot of times they really do fall back on the Enlightenment. Like, and I've always hated the term Enlightenment, really, because it's more like Enlightenments. Absolutely. It wasn't like one monolithic or event. It was just a bunch of groups, which some had contradictory positions to each other yeah like the um the french enlightenment thinkers were on average much more anti-religious than the anglo-american ones and same you know uh, in, in contrast to the german enlightenment thinkers like immanuel kant and whatnot <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah no that's exactly right so as a matter of um sort of the history of ideas people who are separationists are going to be far more likely to argue that america's founders were influenced by the enlightenment especially thinkers like John Locke. And, and of course, there's some truth to that. Absolutely, there is. In um, Did America Have a Christian Founding? I, I don't deny that Locke had influence or Montesquieu. Obviously, these folks had influence. But I argue that uh, America's founders were influenced by their Christian um, convictions. And this is really the, the predominant influence, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As, as for Seidel's book, uh, what would you rate it on accuracy? You know, he's a very nice guy in person, but the book's just horrible. So I would give it maybe a one out of ten. Just a really, really bad book. <laughs> really? Um, one of the two worst books on religion in the American founding that I know of. Well, he does belong to an atheist organization, so you can't rely on them for history. Well, and not well I mean, it's not just that, really, but it's that uh, I'm like, I actually got his book recently. I was more, since he is an actual lawyer... So I've always figured, you know, that he's a constitutional lawyer at that. So okay, okay, I was figure... that, not atheist organization, anti-religious organization. Excuse me. Yeah. But I mean, I wonder, since the Freedom From Religion Foundation does seem to have a pretty good record in court cases, would what would you say that has to do? Is that say more have to do with more liberal judges or the separationist interpretation being more popular? You know, honestly, I'm not sure what the record is. My sense is um, certainly recently they've been losing quite a bit, especially in big cases where they actually go to court. Now, what they often do is they will send a letter to an organization that's doing something that um, they think they ought not to be doing and threaten a lawsuit. And sometimes the um, people receiving that, inf that letter will just stop doing what they were doing because they don't want to go to court and spend lots and lots of money. 
Um, so if you actually look in the, the number of cases they won versus lost, I, I would imagine they have a pretty bad ratio, honestly. Mm. To the extent to which they win, um, they win because... Yeah, and I, I was going to say... Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention, too, that um, someone mentioned Andrew Seidel in his book, and I was going to say that Seidel isn't actually a historian either. He's an envir He's a lawyer for the Freedom of, from Religion Foundation, and he's um, studied environmental science or something like that. <laughs> now, granted, I have not read his book, but just that alone is like, that's going to kind of cloud his biases. <laughs> Well, press read it, so you don't have to. If you guys are interested, I actually reviewed his book on the website Law and Liberty. So you can... Yeah, yeah I, I read your review. I mean, there's just a number of objective factual errors in addition to errors of interpretation. Again, part of this uh, you, you might attribute to the fact that he is an attorney. Attorneys are known for doing what's called law office history. That is, when they go to history, they just look for evidence that they think supports their position and they ignore the rest. I, I think it's a classic instance of law of office history. Right. And I also hear from what he does, what he does is that he doesn't so much argue history, but he, what he does is that he, he argues what he considers to be American values versus biblical Christian values. And he can, declares biblical Christian values to be quote unquote un-American. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. I mean, it's a classic category mistake. So he goes through the amendment, the um, commandments, right? Um, you shall have no law, no God besides the Lord your God. Well, that seems pretty um, clear. But the First Amendment says uh, we're going to have freedom of religion. Therefore, the First Amendment and the First Commandment contradict each other. Um, I think that's just an utterly nonsensical argument, right? I, I'm a very orthodox Christian. I believe in the First Commandment, but I also believe in religious liberty. It, it, it's easy to hold both of those things together. Well, and not, I do not only that, but also I um I think Seidel is forgetting also about the um Christian principle of um, free will. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Jesus is teaching to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I don't want someone to tell me to bow down and worship Baal, so I'm not about to tell someone else to bow down and worship the Christian God. It, it's it's a simple category mistake that a freshman philosopher should um should know not to make. While we're on that, there's people are divided as, or what, as to whether the founding fathers were theists or deists, uh, Christians and deists. Uh, what would you say were the religious beliefs of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin, the, the three main stars? Yeah, I think you have to go um, founder by founder, and you, uh, I'll speak to those three specifically. Um, what I argue in the book is you have author after author claiming that most of America's founders were deists. That's an utterly nonsensical claim. So a deist is, of course, a um, person who believes in a creator God, but then thinks this God sort of leaves the scene, right? So God is not involved in the affairs of many nations. God doesn't do miracles. So if that's our definition of deist, um, almost no Americans meet that definition. Um, maybe Ethan Allen, probably Ethan Allen, probably Thomas Jefferson, although upon occasion he speaks about God engaging in the affairs of men and nations, I think we can say safely that that is rhetorical flourish. Thomas Paine would meet this definition as well, but he's English, right? He spent most of his life actually in Europe, and he's born in England. And um, when he died in America after publishing The Age of Reason, he's vilified because of it. No one wants to have anything to do with him. So with respect to the three men you mentioned, Franklin, as a young man, admits in his um, autobiography that as a young man, he came under the, the spell of the deist. And so he became a deist. And yet he recognized almost right away that this was a dangerous doctrine. And he moved away from it. Toward the end of his life, he seemed to move back into a more theistic sort of position where he believes in God, that God intervenes in the affairs of men and nations. He admits to Ezra Stiles, the president of Yale, that he's not really sure about the divinity of Jesus Christ. And so that would suggest he's not a, an Orthodox Christian, uh, but he's also not a deist. Washington is incredibly private about his religious beliefs. He's an Anglican, of course. He's a vestryman. Um, he speaks all the time about God intervening in the affairs of men and nations. So he would seem not to be a deist, as the term is usually, usually defined. Um, Thomas Jefferson, I think, was the third one. Um, he is one of the most clearly unorthodox of all founders. We know from private letters 
that he denies the divinity of Christ, the existence of miracles, the Trinity, the virgin birth, and so forth. Um, he does seem to believe in God, and so I would put him in the theist category, maybe the deist category. So those are the big three, um, but I would point out these three are not representative of the American founders. Um, when we turn our eyes to the broader constellation of founders, and literally hundreds of men and a few women who are involved in crafting these documents and ratifying these documents and so forth, um, what we see is almost no evidence of this sort of deism and a great deal of evidence that these founders are, in fact, um, Orthodox Christians. Interesting. I've heard from some atheists that like to claim Jefferson and Franklin as their own. Yeah, it, I mean... It, Tough argument to say they're an atheist. I mean, you have to just dismiss lots of what they wrote themselves. Because usually they get this uh, anti-Christian rhetoric from uh, Jefferson, which was actually anti-clerical, if anything. Yeah, it's anti-clerical. And again, he is definitely not an Orthodox Christian. But um, he really seems to be sort of a, um, you know, maybe a liberal Anglican who believes in a creator God who wants us to be good and this sort of thing. He actually said at one point that he um, believed that by the time he died, all Americans would be Unitarians. And that's probably a good description of him as well, right? A Christian who denies the Trinity, um, but certainly believes in God and so forth. Well, and also, yeah. I, I've, uh, I've actually read the um, Jeffersonian Bible parts of it. And multiple times in that book, even though he's a rationalist and he tries to take away like Jesus' divinity and whatnot, he still declares himself a Christian saying that he's a true Christian in the sense that Jesus would want someone to be. <laughs> yeah, so no, we can definitely say it's heretical, but, you know, it's still some kind of Christianity. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's right. Absolutely. And Franklin also had um particular, um, he valued his Puritan upbringing or something, and his Quaker. Yeah, well, more Congregationalist, which are the offshoots of the Puritans for sure. And I think he respected the Quakers, um, but I, as far as I know, he doesn't have any Quaker um, heritage in, in his immediate family anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured I would go through, you know, I was actually looking on a separationist website that seems to be written by some scholars, just so I can get your opinion on some things they may have wrote. And the, and I put, I read, reread your book, good book, by the way. Yeah. And... <laughs> And I figured I would just throw this off, you know, throw it off what, on you and see how you can do. All right. The first question I have to ask. Now, in the second chapter of your book, you do mention the year of our Lord was mentioned in the Constitution, but that it shouldn't be considered a strong point of argument because that was a standard way of writing then. Could mm -hmm. you expound more on that? Yeah, sure. So, um, of course, some people like to point out that the deity is not mentioned in the Constitution. Some Christians say, wait, 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 what about the dateline in the year of our Lord, 1787, when the document was put together? I th simply think it's a mistake to put too much weight on that one way or the other. That, that line didn't come out of the Constitutional Convention. It was added by a scribe. It was in the document sent to the states for ratification. And so I think you can reasonably argue it is a part of the Constitution, but who cares? Documents were routinely dated in this fashion. If that's the only evidence of Christianity in the document, that is a really weak piece of evidence. And so I prefer, as you know, in, in, in the book, I argue that what really matters is not how many times the deity is referenced, but the ideas that inform the, the authors of the Constitution. And here, I think you can make an excellent case for the influence of Christian ideas. Um, the fact that humans are created in the Mago Dei, the image of God, that humans are sinful, that even Christians continue to struggle with the old man within. Um, the Christian understanding of liberty permeates America's founders. Um, and on and on we could go. So it's the ideas that matter. And I, again, I try to make a very good case that America's founders were influenced by Christian ideas when they put together a constitutional order. Mm -hmm. That's actually very interesting. Another one is you bring up how states of the day regularly prohibited work on Sunday, and you tie that to the Christian Sabbath. Isn't it possible, though, that the Sunday's accepted clause was just part of an effort to give the president more d days to veto a bill and not necessarily for religious reasons? Um, and it was along with just that it was to protect the president from the operation of Sunday laws in many states. No, I, I, I think it's 
pretty evident. And I, I, I can't imagine even the most atheist of all historians who look at the late 18th century would, would say there's any reason other than the fourth commandment that the constitution assumes that the, that Congress will not be on the Christian Sabbath. The constitutional convention met every day of the week, except for Sunday. Um, Congress, the house of representatives only met one day, I believe on a Sunday prior to the 20th century, the Senate, maybe only a couple of days. Um, most states had laws prohibiting work on the Christian Sabbath, and they didn't just pick a random day. And of course, the um, provision of the Constitution with respect to the pocket veto, if they wanted more days, they could have just given more days, right? It didn't have to be 10 days. It could have been 12 days, 15 days, whatever. You could have just ignored Sunday altogether. So no, clearly there's an assumption that Christians will not work on the Christian Sabbath. Hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, always, I found that sort of point to be kind of weak because, I mean, I mean, for one, it sort of assumes an either or sort of thing. I mean, there, there could be both. It could be both taking in consideration religious reasons and along with more practical reasons. Also, let's go over um, <clears throat> Thomas Paine, who many atheists hail as one of their champions, even though he was not an atheist by any means. He just well, hated. It's not, what's funny is, is that. Um, What's actually funny about Thomas Paine is that he routinely in his books um, goes over just saying how awful atheism actually is. Mm -hmm. So it's very funny that they actually go to him as some reference point when he actually – one complaint that he made in his book Age of Reason is that he compared Christianity to a form of atheism. So It's kind of what the Romans did. <laughs> yeah, so I mean – like, to, just to point at Thomas Paine of anybody as an atheist is sort of just silly. I believe the that label as Paine as a an atheist goes, I think, to um, Teddy Roosevelt. That's oh, right. He, yeah, the dirty, dirty little atheist. You know, it's just kind of silly. Paine is clearly not an, or, an Orthodox Christian. There's no doubt about it. He seems to be a deist, someone who believes in a creator God who put the world in motion and then stepped away from it. Um, for the life of me, I'm not sure why atheists would care to claim him, right? Why, why, why can't they just recognize he is what he is and say he was wrong? And, and someone like Roger Sherman, who's clearly an orthodox, pious Calvinist, I mean, why don't you just recognize it and say he's wrong, right, if you're an atheist? I, I don't know why you need to try to grab some of these guys for your own team. I, I, I think historians have to be concerned with the truth. I hate slavery. I utterly hate the institution of chattel slavery. But for me to pretend that Washington or Jefferson or Franklin weren't slave owners, that, that's just a malpractice, historical malpractice. Well, yeah. I mean, right. Thomas Jefferson was probably the example of one of the more hypocritical ones because he actually did write um, notes saying how awful slavery was while holding slaves. And sleeping with them. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair to say. He uh, he um, lived an extravagant lifestyle um, for himself, and had he made an effort, he certainly could have freed more of his slaves. He freed a few of them, but he could have freed a lot more. Well, Washington. No, that, that's definitely fair. Yeah, what, like Washington, exactly. Yeah, he freed them upon his uh, death uh, after he no longer needed them. Yeah, which is kind of lame. I agree, but he <laughs> got he got this clear sense that in the 1780s, um, a lot of Americans are coming to question the institution of slavery, to recognize that it's bad. As, as you suggested, Jefferson, is in, in his notes on the state of Virginia, is very clear in condemning slavery, but he also calls it something like having a wolf by the ears. Um, well, they it's a view very, it as the, um, the peculiar institution. Yeah. <clears throat> necessary evil, like... Um... That's very evil, yeah. <laughs> have, have you read Tom Holland's book on the, the Dominion? I've not read it. I've heard of it. It goes over how Christianity is responsible for, is mostly responsible for what we have in Western civilization. And he points out that Christians were the first people in the ancient world to recognize that slavery was inherently wrong. Yeah, no, that sounds right to me. And certainly they were the leader, leading... Um, Advocates of abolitionism yep. in America, in the 18th, and, and especially before, the 19th. And before that, before the Christians argued against uh, slavery in the Roman Empire, there were other figures that said slavery was bad, but it was a necessary evil. Like Christians were the first ones to rationalize that it was 
inherently wrong and nobody should ever do it. And to well, give yeah. the, the founding fathers their credit, um, in the in eighteen oh eight onward, you had the blockade of Africa, which which hugely forbidden the the international slave trade. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Jefferson was very much an advocate of that of that measure. <laughs> yeah, I, what I do find funny is that they do go over like they really do praise the Enlightenment, but they don't like a lot of the 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 founding fathers' uncertainty about slavery came from the Enlightenment thinking, like. Because they were pra- like the Enlightenment thinkers praised humans, but they also had this like um, cognitive dissonance because they said, "Wait, we have slaves, and we also are sexist. These people are humans, so we sort of have to figure out a way of reconciling that fact." And, su- so, and scientific racism was a product of the Enlightenment. Yeah, no, it absolutely was. Yeah, so I, w- I would say the abolitionists were primarily motivated by Christian. Convictions, the Enlightenment, I think, probably actually did more to prolong slavery through the scientific racism. That's exactly right. Well, you know what's funny um, is that um, Seidel actually talks about what he calls positive influence of Christianity. Did did quote Christianity and in, positively influence the United States, and he tries to bring up slavery as an example of Christianity uh, prolonging slavery in the United States, which I think is ridic- ridiculous. <laughs> Well, some did, but Christianity wasn't the only rationalization. There was also a that pseudoscience phrenology. Yeah, yeah. and Jeffersonianism. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, since we're on the topic of Jefferson, I'll go to my third point. Uh, you go into a little bit on Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptists. Many separationists make the argument that this letter wasn't merely about Congress not making a national establishment. But the oppression of the Danbury Baptists in Connecticut, as they wanted, they had to give money to support a Congressionalist church. What would you say to that? Yeah, so I think um, Jefferson clearly wanted a greater degree of separation between church and state than almost any founder. For instance, Washington issued calls for prayer and fasting and Thanksgiving Day proclamations, as did John Adams, as did James Madison. Jefferson refused to do so, and he specifically tells us he refuses to do so for First and Tenth Amendment reasons. I I think what he articulated in the letter to the Danbury Baptist, where he said, in fact, that that the Establishment Clause creates a wall of separation between church and state, that is definitely the direction he wanted America to go. Uh, But I think it's completely irrelevant, really. Jefferson played no role in drafting the First Amendment. He played no role in ratifying the First Amendment. And Jefferson certainly didn't act as if there was a wall of separation between church and state. Literally two days after he penned that letter, he went to church services in the U.S. Capitol building where he heard John Leland, the great Baptist itinerant minister, and himself an opponent of religious establishments preach. Um, Jefferson opened the War Department building, the Treasury Department building for church services. He negotiated the treaty or, or sent the treaty with the Kaskaskia Indians onto the Senate that provided money, federal money, for a priest and to build a church. Um, so even Jefferson, I, I, I think this is probably reflecting of his desires, uh, but not his actions. And when you turn to the rest of the American founders, you see nothing like um, a desire to separate strictly church and state. Madison a little bit. But even him, not so much. Uh, but when you turn to the rest of the first federal Congress, uh, people in the state legislatures and whatnot, you, you get nothing like the strict separation of church and state. I think what some people forget is that um, there's actually a difference between what, what is known as friendly separation of church and state and hostile separation of church and state. So mm-hmm. we mentioned early, um, a hostile version of separation of church and state would be like in France during the French Revolution. But what we have is more friendly toward the churches. And in fact, um, one of the uh, draft, drafters of the, univer- um, the UN's Declaration of Human Rights, Jacques Maritain, he actually pointed out the uniqueness in the American system and how church and state, even though they're separate, they still, they're not hostile to one another, unlike in France, which was his home country. Yeah, no, that, that's excellent. Yeah, I actually don't like the language of separation of church and state. I mean, you could say, you know, all Christians have to support the separation of church and state. The church is one institution, the state is another institution. The two ought not to be the same. The yeah, state render up Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right back to Jesus. 
Yeah, so that's why usually in, in speaking about it, I'll make sure that we're talking about say, the, the strict separation of church and state, a wall of separation between church and state, clearly not what the founders desired. But on the other hand, they wanted a form of separation. They did not want the church to be controlled by the state. And thank goodness, that never works out well for the church. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, oftentimes forgotten, I think, is um, the intellectual godfather of separation of church and state in the United States is um, Roger Williams, who was a Puritan theologian. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair enough. Yeah, in a very, you know, incredibly pious, very conservative, if if you want, for want of a better word, man. But yeah, he just simply thought that there should be a a wall between the garden of the church and uh, the the wilderness of the world. I think it's the way he put it. Well, yeah. I mean, if you actually go back, like, because as you had pointed out in your book, Jefferson only used that phrase, the wall of separation between church and state, once. Mm-hmm. And is in like in all of his writings, and it's not even original to him. I think what's in, I think the reason why he used it was because of who he was talking to, the Baptists. If you go back to their leaders, their leaders were like their traditions. They were all about separation of church and state. So he said that more because like he knew who he was talking to. They would get it, the reference. Yeah, no, I think that's right. But even that, you know, when, when you think about the Baptists, they are in no way, shape, or form supporting the sort of separation between church and state that Americans United for Separation of Church and State or the ACLU or, or groups like that advocate for today, as evidenced by um, their leader, Isaac Backus. Uh, I'm sorry, John Leland, who preached in the U.S. Congress. He saw no problem with this sort of thing. Um, yeah, they didn't want the church to be controlled by the state. They didn't like the congregational establishment in Connecticut, um, but they didn't advocate anything like what Jefferson was suggesting with this wall metaphor. Yeah, yeah. and I can definitely agree with that because um, there has been points in history where, say, a, a nation state is going to choose one particular sect or one particular denomination of a religion, and yeah, only that is allowed. <laughs> What was, sure. uh, Franklin, what was Franklin and Washington's outlook on it in particular? Yeah, so um, Washington's pretty easy. He saw no problem with the state um, supporting the church in various ways, or religion in various ways. So one of my favorite stories, actually, is that literally the day after Congress put together the House of Representatives, agreed upon the language of what became the First Amendment, Elias Boudinot, who later became president of the American Bible Society, said, hey, we should ask President Washington issue a Thanksgiving Day proclamation. Um, Adonis Burke of South Carolina said, no, 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 we can't do that. Uh, but Roger Sherman, this old Puritan, said, of course we can do it. It's a biblical practice. The House agreed with Boudinot and Sherman. The Senate agreed with the House. And President Washington had no problem issuing a Thanksgiving Day proclamation. You all should read it if you haven't read it recently. The 1789 Thanksgiving Day proclamation, you can find it all over the internet. It's wonderfully theologically robust. Washington um, issued other Thanksgiving Day proclamations, calls for prayer and fasting. He um, wanted chaplains um, for the military, and on and on you could go. So again, these are appropriate ways in which church and state may cooperate. Uh, But Washington, just like almost everyone, didn't want um, the state to control the church. Franklin is a little more loosey-goosey on this sort of thing, and we have a lot less evidence for him. But a famous story involving Franklin is in the federal convention. He suggested, um, he actually said, I'll, I'll paraphrase him, he said, the longer I live, the more I see that God controls human events. And therefore, what we should do is bring in a, a, a clergyman to pray for us every day. Now, the Congress, the Constitutional Convention ended up not going along with that because they thought that might send alarm bells, that people would think that something was wrong. Um, but that seems to suggest that even Franklin, who is not an Orthodox Christian, didn't see anything wrong with having a legislative chaplain or that sort of thing. So again, when you turn from Jefferson and Madison to the rest of the founding generation, you just see nothing like a desire to strictly separate church and state. I was amazed to find out, um, researching the National Day of Prayer, that it does actually have origins in uh, early American, in the early American Republic era. And it wasn't up until about 1807, 1817 that it fell out of favor, only to come back in the 1950s again. So that really um, surprised me. 
Yeah, sure. Th yeah, through the Continental Confederation Congress and to the New Republic and onward, you routinely had this sort of thing going on. A big worry I've noticed about... Uh, Brass, Brass, you're way too low. A big worry I've noticed about many non-Christians with this issue is that ignoring their views outside of the strict separation and interpretation is that they worry that, you know, if you don't take in the separations in battle, they'll ultimately lead to a theocracy and they'll be discriminated against. You're going to have they to say that. Out, you know, you're going like, to this, this, you're gonna have to say that again. You're a robot in and out. Gay people. What is your take on that? You're going to have to say that again because you're a robot in and out. All right. The big worry I've noticed about hey, excuse me, you're still kind of doing it, but I, I heard part of it. So I, I, what I heard was a, a fear of theocracy and this sort of thing, which, yeah, I don't think anyone in their right mind wants to live in a theocracy unless we're talking literally about God reigning on earth as he will in the eschaton. Oh, we're yeah. talking about they're, they usually talk about handman's tail stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> just complete and utter nonsense. So if, if you read my book, you'll know that I go out of my way to make it clear that America's founders embraced a very robust conception of religious liberty that would protect all Americans, Christian or not. I quote several times Washington's letter, his wonderful letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, where he makes it crystal clear that the, this tiny handful of Jews had no political power, that they had the same right as Christians to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. The Constitution, Constitution banned religious tests for office. And so, yeah, I think for very profoundly Christian reasons, we have to insist that everyone should be able to worship God according to the dictates of conscience, Christians and non-Christians alike. <clears throat> Again, I, I think Christians are going to advocate for things in the public square. Um, they advocated for the abolition of slavery, right? Now, that was a contentious issue, but thank goodness these Christians were out there fighting to end um, this horrible institution in the civil rights era. Christians marched in the streets to secure civil rights for all. The leaders of the civil rights movement were almost all ministers, right? The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Jesse Jackson, and so forth. And so I would say if you take a step back and you don't get your information from fictional books like The Handmaiden's Tale, and you look at the history of America, that you'll conclude that when Americans, when Christians are involved in politics, when they're bringing their faith into the public square, um, this is generally a good thing. That's not to say Christians haven't made mistakes. Of course they had, but it's generally a good thing. And it certainly is permitted by the by the Constitution. Here, incidentally, is a very important reason why that wall metaphor is so misleading. Think about the Establishment Clause. If you actually read the text, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That is a one-way barrier. It restricts Congress and, by extension, the states. On the other hand, um, the wall metaphor suggests a bilateral barrier, right? It restricts the government, to be sure, but it also restricts citizens of faith. Um, but the Constitution doesn't have a wall of separation. It has an establishment clause. So Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus have every right to advocate for their beliefs in the public square. It's a belief, uh, a right protected by the Constitution, I would argue. And anti-religious people like to harp on the fact that yeah, believers I mean, used the Bible to justify slavery, because, but that just shows they didn't even know their own Bibles because the Canaanites were not black. Yeah, no, you're right. So Christians have misused the Bible, but Christians have also used the Bible to attack slavery and so forth and so on. Yeah, so, um, and again, don't hear me arguing Christians are never mistaken. Of course Christians are mistaken, just like everyone is mistaken. Yeah, and a guy like Washington would, would have to believe in an almighty creator because he cheated death numerous times on the battlefield. There was one time where Indians reported that bullets flew past him when he was standing right in the midst of it. Yeah, and he certainly, in a, in a private letter, um, he, he gave the glory to God for having survived a, um, a, a number of close uh, close bullet rifle shots in a, um, in a in a battle. Yeah, so absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a reason why that they say that, like, a non-separation is interpretation leads to stuff like a theocracy is like because they give an example of like Christians refusing to do certain services for gay people, such as uh, the you mentioned your book the 
the the incident with the gay Christian, like with the Christian Baker. Mm-hmm. Well, what's yeah. your take on this? Was, uh, yeah. So first of all, let's just back away from the language of theocracy. Um, you know, <laughs> Baron Stutzman is a 65 year old grandmother. She hires um, same sex people to work in her florist shop. She knowingly and willingly served the same sex couple for years and years and years, $4,500 worth of business. The one thing she said she could not do is participate in a same-sex wedding ceremony, that she couldn't design, custom, and create flowers for the same-sex wedding ceremony. Um, but she found three other florists within miles who were willing to do it. That is not a theocracy. That's just a silly use of the word theocracy. And I'm not being critical of you because a lot of other people throw that thing around, that label around. And so what I would suggest that these sorts of issues really have to do with liberty. No one should be forced to go against their conscience unless there's a very compelling reason. So think just for a moment, should an African-American baker have to make a cake for the KKK? No. Should a Jewish no. baker have to bake a cake sent for Muslims saying all Jews should be killed? No. no. Nazis. That's ridiculous, right? It's liberty. People should have the freedom to act according to their convictions wherever possible. Then you'll never hear from it from SJWs and uh, hard leftists. Yeah, like, no, I think like that's fair. They, they recently caved in and start, stopped donating the charities that are against same sex marriage and stuff like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. The um, you know the power clearly is on uh, on these sorts of issues on the on the political left. Corporation after corporation is you know, going after people who um, don't, in their minds, properly celebrate LGBTQ weddings and this sort of thing. Um, I actually I, I'm a very traditional Orthodox Christian, um, but with respect to that sort of thing, I, I really have no objection to permitting two men or two women to get married. Um, right. And I just wish the other side would have the, the same amount of grace, right? Why force people to participate in a wedding ceremony against their convictions? It makes very little sense. And you have actual- another thing that annoys me too about this whole like theocracy thing is that as someone who studied history, and I'm not and I'm definitely not in favor of any kind of theocracy. I'm very happy with the current Republican form of government we have in the <laughs> USA, but there are many theocracies that were actually tolerant of other religions like. In Tibet, uh, Protestant missionaries could actually evangelize in in this Buddhist theocracy in Tibet under the Dalai Lama. So I just as historical complexity, the, the whole new atheist um, theocracy is immediately in intolerance in has always annoyed me. <laughs> sure, yeah, no, that's a fair point. And the Chinese didn't like that though, so they got rid of them. Yeah, Sorry. in the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I don't want any kind of theocracy. I just, uh, I'm, I'm happy with the Republican form of government. <laughs> Agreed. Absolutely. Oh, we're supposed to be a democracy. <laughs> so uh, speaking of that too, um, I noticed that there's a term being lodged around lately and it's, uh, the term is Christian nationalism. And I know the Seidel has used it and a lot of other uh, left-wing figures have used it. So what is your uh, take on that? Yeah, so one of the things that I do in my book is I, I make it clear to a clear distinction between America having a Christian founding, by which I mean that America's founders were influenced by Christian ideas, versus America being founded as a Christian nation. I really don't like that formulation because it sounds very exclusive. You know, even if we're going to allow Jews to be here or Muslims, they're sort of here at, at, at our sufferance. That is absolutely not. Um, the American founders' views, right? Mm -hmm. They banned religious tests for office. Washington wrote this wonderful letter to the Hebrew synagogue. Um, and of course, our nation has very appropriately, I, th I think, celebrated diversity. And yes, I don't like the Christian nation language. I think someone like Andrew Seidel uses it because it's easier to kind of set up and knock down than to take seriously the sort of arguments that I make in my book. Well, that and it goes because of the anti Trump bias and the evangelicals being so much of a, on the pro Trump side. And they, and they grieve about um, not us not ever having a non religious president. I mean, we have one in office and they're still not satisfied. 
<laughs> yeah, it's an interesting um, reality, isn't it? So back in the 1950s, they, they did polls. Would you vote for an African-American for president? Would you vote for a woman for president? And uh, the results are horrible. It's like 80 percent, 85 percent say no, no, I never would. Um, today, when you look at those same polls, it's like 3 percent, 4 percent who would vote for an African-American or a woman. And obviously, we just had an African-American president. When it comes to an atheist, still about half of Americans will say, I would not vote for an atheist for president. And even someone like Donald Trump, who clearly is not a, a paragon of virtue, of, of piety, um, you know, he certainly claims to be a Christian and claims faith is important to his life. And so that is kind of an interesting reality, isn't it? He tells, tells his uh, followers what they want to hear because most of them are funded jellicals. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And what president does it, right? Um, almost no president talked more about his faith than Barack Obama, in part because he was accused yeah. of being Muslim. Yeah, so no, that certainly goes on all the like time. People are, people are divided on Obama. They call him uh, Muslim, some others will call him the Antichrist, and others would call him a messianic figure. Yeah, no, that's right. Absolutely. I just think he was a progressive Christian. <laughs> yeah, that's probably, you know, it's just hard to tell. Honestly, um, there's very little evidence, very you know, virtually none, that he was actually a Muslim. But in terms of his yeah. actual conviction, well, he, he grew up in in much of the, I think it was Indonesia. He grew up part of his life in. It's supposed it's, to be uh, yeah, but not much I don't think. Yeah, not a whole lot. Yeah. I'm not saying he's Muslim. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, another popular um, piece of evidence that uh, separationists usually give is the Treaty of Tripoli. It seems to be very popular in separationist circles. What do you make of it? Sure. So the Treaty of Tripoli is famous for stating that America was not founded on the Christian religion. It was about 1796 or so. Um, I think the context here explains so much. So after America broke from Great Britain, the British Navy, fairly enough, stopped protecting American ships. This means that American ships were being seized by these pirates in North Africa and places like Algeria in Tripoli. The Barbary pirates. The Barbary pirates, exactly right. And they would seize these ships, they would loot these ships, they would imprison American sailors, and they would make them slaves. And so this was a real problem. And America just simply did not have the military might in the 18th century to go over there and defeat them. And so we negotiated this treaty. A fellow named Joel Barlow actually went and negotiated this treaty. And basically it was trying to make peace with these Islamic pirates. And so one of the provisions said that we aren't founded as a Christian nation. Um, and it went on to say, we'll pay you reparations and we'll pay you um, basically ransom and so forth. And so this was in the first treaty. It went to the U.S. Senate. It was known to the public. It was ratified unanimously by the U.S. Senate. And that, I think, tells us a lot, because if this was viewed as a principled statement of church-state relations, it would have been incredibly controversial. Certainly, there would be people fighting it tooth and nail, but no one fought it, because it was just viewed as a prudential way of making peace with these pirates. The treaty was renegotiated a number of times, and that phrase was removed. And then, of course, eventually, President Jefferson sent the Marines in to clean house, and that largely solved their problem with the Barbary pirates. I also yeah, read yeah. that um, the 18, that in 1805 the Treaty of Tripoli actually was broken, or it, they they no longer abided by it anymore. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah, I, I used to know that better. There there was a number of treaties, and it went back and forth, and the pirates broke it, and so forth and so on. Eventually, of course, Jefferson sent the uh, Marines in um, to wipe out Tripoli, and that's where you get in the in the Marine Corps anthem, right? The, from the, the shores of Tripoli, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I believe they take it too far with it because it merely says that the government isn't founded on principle. It says nothing about the culture. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I don't blame them. It's one of the very few documents that offers support for their position. So if I was trying to argue for their position, I would undoubtedly emphasize it. Um, but again, it, it, you get this one document, you know, a couple of others, the detached memorandum, the moral and remonstrance. Um, but uh, in contrast to that, you have a bazillion other documents that give lots of great evidence that America's founders were influenced by Christian ideas. They use scripture all the time, oftentimes without citation. Um, there's just really no good reason to believe that Christianity was not an incredibly important influence 
on America's founders. I was going to say there was um there was actually a, another treaty called the the Treaty of Tunis in 1797, about a year after the Treaty of Tripoli. And in the Treaty of Tunis, it actually uh, used the phrase to those who hold the Messiah, referring to indirectly to Christianity and to probably, you know, greater Abrahamic religions in general. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, look that up. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, I was thinking. So, you said you have another book planned. What do you think it's going to be more about? You think it's going to be like sort of a sequel to your um, the book that you just recently released, I believe, or a part two? Yeah. So it will it will range a little further. So I think I'll start with the Puritans and address a very common myth by which I mean a, a, a false story that the Puritans were intolerant theocrats who hated fun, basically. Um, I'll move back to the founding era. We'll I'll address a few issues, um, a few arguments that are made, that America could not have had a Christian founding because the founders didn't immediately abolish slavery, or that the American founders were an unchurched people, an unchurched generation. But then I think I'll also push into the 19th century and look at the abolitionist movement, look at the rise of the separation of church and state in the late 19th century, which was largely an anti-Catholic phenomenon. Yeah, so it'll be, more, it'll be more wide-ranging. Then there's Christians in the 19th century who set up the Atlantic, the went along with the Atlantic slave trade and based their slavery on uh, Levitical laws on how to treat them. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll definitely deal with the whole slavery um, slavery issue. Again, the argument there will not be to deny that some Christians appeal to the Bible to defend the institution of slavery. Clearly they did. But the weight and the direction the nation was going is was to move in a direction of opposing slavery for profoundly Christian reasons. Yeah. Then there's... Uh, the, and we all... Go ahead. I was going to say, well, that and the fact that we actually do have a Bible that slave owners actually used, and it pretty much cut out the exodus. Yeah. And, yeah. It cut out pretty much any sort of thing that could be used by slaves as a rebellion. And cut out much of the much of the New Testament also. Yeah, and eventually a lot of slave states passed laws prohibiting slaves from learning to read, precisely because they understood that was very dangerous. I think it would be really well, yeah, very so interesting. Partly to... because they that they would pick up the because like one of the, the biggest books that slave owners used was the Bible in some circumstances. So they were worried that if slaves were able to read, they would be able to actually pick up the Bible, read it, and then use that as a way of rebelling against them. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's exactly right. So they understood that the Bible was a, a, a book that promoted liberty in the final analysis. And I, I think that's you know, one of the important arguments in my book, that the founders embraced religious liberty and other liberties precisely because of their Christian convictions, not in spite of them. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to put together like a, a project dealing like with the religious history of the United States, looking at different religions from uh, evangelicalism to Mormonism to Islam to Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, believe it or not, there's actually a hidden Orthodoxy um, or Eastern Orthodox history in the United States and Alaska going back to the Russian colonial period. <laughs> Right, yeah, that's interesting. I'm just having to move inside because my you know, battery's dying. And there's the uh, anti-Catholic sentiment which led to the discrimination of the Irish during the uh, early American modern period. Yeah, and I was going to say the Blaine Amendment. They say that's where the Blaine Amendment came from, which is being debated right now. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I'll cover that in my um, sequel. I, I think it's exactly the the profound anti-Catholicism of the mid to late 19th century, early, early 20th century, where you first begin to see this argument that church and state should be separated. And it's, uh, it's weird that um, Irish were just as looked down upon as uh, blacks and Indians and Jews were. Yeah, in, in some ways um, more so. So I, I've, I've heard, I'm not sure this is... I haven't seen the primary sources myself, but if you're a slave owner and you have a really dangerous job, you don't want your slave to do that job because that slave's worth a lot of money to you. So you'd go and hire an Irishman to do it. So yeah, you're, you're right. 
Yeah, yeah there, there is. A, they used to say there was a horsepower, a gun power, um, steam power, and Irish power. Well, you know the the, the Titanic was actually constructed using um, Irish labor. <laughs> yep. Yeah. 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 Sure. yeah that. Yeah. Uh, another thing I think we could go into also is about how the Everspace the and what? the Everson, that's where a lot, like the 1947 uh, case that, that's the first one that used the Thomas Jefferson wall of separation between church and state. Um, you actually, in your book, went over that and how there was a strong anti Catholic um, perspective in that. Would you like to go over that for the audience? Yeah, sure. So the um, Everson versus Board of Education was a 1947 case where the U.S. Supreme Court, for the first time, said the Establishment Clause applies to the states just like it does the national government. And what the court did there, Justice Black in his majority opinion and, and Justice Rutledge in his dissenting opinion, they both said that we must interpret the First Amendment in light of Jefferson and Madison's views. Jefferson and Madison wanted the strict separation of church and state, therefore the Establishment Clause requires the strict separation of church and state. And so this is where this pernicious myth really got going. Now, as, a, as an aside, a lot of the people who are opposing or who are advocating for the um, separation of church and state in this era were, in fact, uh, people like the KKK or groups like the KKK and the Masons. So someone like Hugo Black actually was a member of the KKK. In um, 19, it was right around that time, right, 1947, 1948, then an organization was founded, Protestants and Others United, for separation of church and state. Think about that, Protestants and Others United. It was a profoundly anti-Catholic organization. Um, that organization is still with us today. It's now called Americans United for Separation of Church and State. I don't think it's fair to say they're anti-Catholic anymore, just more broadly anti-religious. Still same yeah. line of imagery. Yeah. The, yeah, the, I, I still do know, like, it is sort of funny that if Biden wins, that'd be the only, the second Catholic president we've ever had. Yep, first was Kennedy. And he got yeah. killed. Yeah, no, that's yeah. right. Uh, but, I, yeah, I think it's hard to argue nowadays that someone like a Senator Kerry lost because he was Catholic. Um, I, th I think those sort of animosities really have been put behind us. And actually, in my sequel, I, I argue that it's in the 1960s that we see this happen. Um, Vatican II, of course, is very important. Uh, uh, the Catholic Church basically embraces a more liberal um, a view of religious liberty and freedom of speech and this sort of thing. And then Catholics and, and Protestants who are sincere about their faith find a lot of common cause in the 1970s and into the 1980s, the pro-life movement, the protection of religious liberty, um, anti-communism. And so I think those old, um, that anti-Catholic animus is really far behind us now. So, you know, Roman Catholic candidates um, in the Republican Party um, would have just as, as good of a shot as winning the presidential nomination and presidential um, election as would say a Protestant, I think, in this day and age. Also, I, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to stipulate, of course, there's still some anti-Catholic bigots out there. I'm not trying to say everything is perfect, um, but it's not a major problem anymore. Yeah, pretty much. So, I, mean, I got through with my questions. Um, you got any of yours, own oh, Robert? Rob. Oh, hi. Um, what's going on? Sorry, I kind of lost out. Any questions left? Uh, I was just saying, um, yeah, if you had any questions of your own. Um, not really. I mean, I just um, I just find it so fascinating, the study of this American religious history. And I think I mentioned, if I haven't men mentioned before, I'm Eastern Orthodox. And um, we have a <clears throat> tumultuous history in the United States, in Alaska predominantly. And after Alaska was purchased from the Russian Empire in 1867, the U.S. government supported Presbyterian missionaries who tried to evangelize the so-called heathen Native, Amer Native Alaskans. The problem is they were, they were already Christian, just Eastern Orthodox, and they, they employed a lot of anti-Catholic tropes, 
against the um, Orthodox Church as well. So that's really fascinating, I thought. That, that's another issue. <laughs> so that, I am definitely in favor of um, church state. And which leads us to the, to the Native American Indians. Uh, a lot of them are Christians, but like the anti-religious nut jobs out there like to make these uh, racist claims because it's ultimately racist that they're only that way because the uh, big bad Christians forced them to convert well not in the see what I loved about Eastern Orthodoxy is that the um, many of the um, priests who went to Alaska they never ha had any ethnocentric uh, views toward the native Alaskans and like say um, Saint Herman and Saint Innocent they were against exploitation of the native Alaskans which was very different to than say like the Anglo Protestants in continental U.S. who were basically wanted to try to turn the Native Americans in, into white men. <laughs> and then there's, their hair and there's the incidences in South, the South American Indians that, yeah, the con conquests were fucking brutal, but can't just pretend they were innocent either. They were just as fucking savage and brutal as the white man was. We just had better tools. Well, many, um, many Native, you're, if you're talking about like Latin America, many Native um, yeah. Americans yeah. actually sided like, with the Spanish when they came. Yeah. Like in uh, Mexico and Brazil. Yeah. Uh, Indian auxiliaries, they were called. But yeah, I, um, I, I am definitely for separation of church and state. My my patron saint, who is um, my profile pick, as you may um, guess, um, his name is Peter the Aleutian, and he was actually martyred by Catholic, Catholic Spaniards in 1815 in what is now California, San Francisco, mm -hmm. so... <laughs> Interesting. All right. Yeah, so so I am very much for separation of church and state, but uh, but for, like I said, um, the friendly version, not the hostile version that the French revolutionaries established. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds right to me. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's all I just wanted to comment. <laughs> yeah, um, so what about you, um, Carlos? Who's Carlos? Please go and say it. <laughs> no philosophy. Nobody knows my real name. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, a good time to wrap up, uh, unless you have any final thoughts, uh, Dr. Hall? Yeah, no, I don't. Thank you all so much for um, chatting with me. It's been real enjoyable. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you want to tell people where they can meet you up at if they want to contact you? Yeah, so my wife um, was very nice. She built a little website for me called... Um, I think it's um, markdavidhall.org. That's all it is. Yeah, so easy as pie. Just type it in. You should be able to find it. It um, has all sorts of information about how to contact me, about my books, and that sort of thing. Okay, this has been a refutation of the new atheist myth of American history. And uh, please like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification because this channel is demonetized and it doesn't go in the algorithm very nicely. So do that, and we'll see you all next time. All right. Take care. Thank you. Peace.